Hi, my name is Lincoln Brewster, and I want to welcome you to Volume 2 of my Guitar Instructional Series. Now, before we dive into the actual playing, I want to take a minute and just explain the purpose of this particular volume. When you walk away from this volume, it's my hope, obviously, that you'll be able to play some of the solos, but more so, that you'll be able to compose solos of your own. And I want to give you some key tools that I use that are building blocks on the stuff we covered in Volume 1, like vibrato and bending, alternate picking, and those things. We'll actually take that to the next level on this volume. And I think when you pair those together, you'll find that your lead playing is going to have a whole new depth to it, and uh, I think you'll enjoy playing your solos even that much more. On this volume, we're going to be covering legato playing versus staccato playing. And uh, I love talking about that because it's really a nuanced thing. And it'll really help your playing and your, your lead playing take on a whole new depth. And uh, so I'm excited to show you that and how I incorporate that into my solos. I'm going to give you some examples at the top of that section. And it's going to seem a bit like taking a drink from a fire hose at first. But they're just examples and I will take them in the warm-ups and exercises section. And I'll slow them down and unpack them for you so that you can see the patterns that I'm using to uh, display those two techniques. Uh, also, I'm going to show you seven different positions that you can play scales. And uh, each one of these scales is going to have a mode name. And I got a lot of requests for unpacking what modes I use when I do my solos. And uh, so I'm excited to uh, show you that as well. You'll be able to play one scale from one side of the neck all the way up to the other uh, if you master those patterns. And uh, it's a very, very cool section. I'll also be showing you some riffs that I like to do. And uh, sometimes it's nice to, rather than just having a pattern, you actually have a specific riff that you can throw in, kind of plug it into different spots as you hear it. So I'll show you some that I like to use a lot in my solos. And uh, as I teach you some of the solos uh, from my songs toward the latter part of this volume, uh, you'll hear some of those licks come out, I'm sure. Another thing I'll be taking an in-depth look at is kind of my thought process behind composing solos. And I've had a lot of requests to really unpack that whole process. And so I'm going to do that on this volume. And I'll kind of really take you through step by step exactly what I was thinking as much as I can remember uh, about when I was writing these solos. And uh, boy, I think that's one of the keys to becoming a good lead player is being able to come up with a composition. It's not just playing everything you got every time you play a solo, but really learning to pace yourself use these techniques to be more expressive and more dynamic and come up with truly great solos, not just something where you're shredding over the top of a progression. And I'm also going to be including four songs from the new Today is the Day CD, and I'll break down the rhythm parts and solo parts and show you those note by note. I'll be covering Today is the Day, Give Him Praise, God You Reign, and Let Your Glory Shine. So I'm looking forward to uh, sharing this time with you, and thanks a lot for checking out this DVD. I hope it's a blessing to you and to your playing. The first technique that I want to cover is actually called legato, and uh, it's just a different style of playing. And legato is actually an Italian word, and it means tied together. So these notes are going to be played in a much smoother fashion than if you were doing alternate picking as we covered in volume one. So let me give you an example of some legato style playing. One of the things you'll notice about legato playing technique is that it'll feel like you run out of steam a little bit as you're working down the notes. So it's actually pretty difficult for your left hand because it's doing all of the work. And uh, so one of the things that I'll do is actually I'll kind of pick occasionally to kind of keep the riff alive. Uh, and I don't know if you've ever been out to the water and been skipping rocks, but you, know, you see how the rock kind of skips off of the water. That's how your pick, your pick kind of functions like the water, it keeps it going. And uh, when you really want it smooth and not a lot of that pick attack, you try to pick as few times as possible in one of those runs. And uh, this might sound like a lot right now, um, and that was, you know, kind of a high-speed legato lick, but I'm going to show you how to do it and develop your speed, and uh, some of the solos I'll teach you later have some of that technique in it, so I want to make sure that you've got a handle on it before we dive into that. Now, I'm going to play you an example of doing what I was talking about, about picking occasionally through a legato riff, and uh, I actually will slow this riff down uh, when we cover the advanced pattern section and you know solo techniques. So I'll show you this exact riff and uh, play it at a slower speed. But I'm going to show you the difference of when I play this, I'll do it uh, a little bit of legato, 
Uh, and then you, you'll watch, if you watch my picking hand, you'll see that I'm occasionally just bouncing it off the strings and keeping those runs alive. So uh, here we go. Another important soloing technique is to use staccato style picking. And staccato is the absolute opposite of legato. So staccato actually means uh, separated. So you want to separate the notes, and that's going to require a lot of picking, uh, alternate picking, which I covered in volume one in detail. And uh, so I'll show you kind of the difference between those two. But if you take uh, and play a staccato style riff, it can sound very, very cool. Another cool thing that you can do with staccato style playing is you can use a palm mute. And uh, I covered this in volume one, but if you look at that palm there, it just kind of uh, lays on the strings and you can press down a little bit and get kind of a really muted, tighter sound. And uh, so there's kind of varying degrees of staccato. Uh, so I'll give you a playing example of really tightening down that playing. And again, part of the reason I'm showing this to you is it just adds a lot more depth and a lot more options to your soloing and your playing so that when you get into a, a soloing situation, and I'll teach you a solo on a song called Let Your Glory Shine later in this volume, where I do exactly this. I use varying degrees of staccato playing. So uh, what I'm going to do is play a lick. Uh, I'm going to do it a little more open, and then I'll, I'll mute it down and make it much, much tighter, uh, and then I'll open it back up again. Now that I've covered legato and staccato, I'm going to play you a riff that actually goes back and forth between the two and kind of combines them a little bit. And uh, again, as I'm teaching my solos later, you'll find that I like to do that a lot and kind of just use both techniques and create a little bit more depth and variety. <laughs> All right, well, there's some detail on staccato and legato and kind of how they work into my playing and hopefully a way that you can work them into your playing. Uh, again, I'll take some of those licks that I was playing and slow them way, way down and break them down note by note and uh, really give you the details on those so that you can take them, work them real slow and work up to speed. Right now, we're gonna cover some advanced warm-ups and exercises that you can use to do exactly that. Get warmed up and uh, kind of get some exercise for your fingers. Um, the reason I wanted you to learn the staccato and legato techniques first is I didn't cover those on the last volume and they're going to actually be important to a lot of the stuff that you're going to learn on this volume. So uh, I'm going to show you some new patterns and uh, the cool thing about these um, are that you can again just take them slow and uh, do them at your own pace. Uh, but as I covered on volume one, you, you want to make sure and do these at a consistent tempo and no faster than you can do them accurately. That's what's going to develop your speed and crispness is just doing them uh, with repetition, uh, dead slow or, or whatever tempo you need to play them at. And one of the patterns that I want to show you uh, first actually kind of works around a chromatic type idea. And I covered uh, the basic version of this exercise on volume one. But we're going to take it up a couple of notches for volume two. Um, now, I've known a thing for years called sequential fours. Um, basically deals with four note phrases that repeat, but they're offset by one note as they ascend or descend uh, down a scale. Um, so I decided to alter it a little bit and I came up with a thing called sequential fives and uh, it applies to this particular exercise and this is a great exercise to develop that uh, speed and accuracy and really syncing your hands together and uh, it also requires a bit of patience and so uh, we're going to start on this exercise rooting on the low E string with the index finger and uh, what this exercise does is why it's called sequential fives is it deals with five note phrases and then you're going to repeat five notes ascending first then descending as we come down but you're going to always offset by moving up one half step so uh, it goes like this index finger on the third fret low e string 
Again, using alternate picking. Middle finger on the fourth fret, low E string. Ring finger on the fifth fret. And then pinky on the sixth fret. And then index finger on the back to the third fret, but you're going to switch to the A string right there. And um, if you haven't checked out volume one, one of the things uh, about this exercise is it just stays in the same group of frets. It never moves, so it's basically like that. But we're just going to, like I said, take it up a couple notches. So let's do that first five note phrase. Then the idea behind a sequential five is you're going to go to the second note of the pattern and you're going to go up five more notes. So this next one's going to start with the middle finger. So, and if you remember, check your alternate picking down, up, down, up, down. Uh, so the next note is going to be an upstroke. So you're going to actually go back to the low E string on an upstroke. So middle finger, ring finger, downstroke, pinky upstroke. And then we're going to go up one more note beyond the first phrase. So those first two phrases go like this. Now moving on to the third phrase, it starts with the third note, which is a downstroke, ring finger, fifth fret, low E string, upstroke on the pinky, downstroke, index finger, A string, third fret, fourth fret, middle finger, upstroke, and then a downstroke on the ring finger. So let's now put those first three phrases together. And then we're going to go ahead and go up to one more note and complete the first, uh, the the east, the low E string and the A string. Those first two strings. So, um, so the fourth phrase starts on the pinky. And that's on an upstroke. A downstroke on the index finger there. Upstroke middle, down on the ring finger, up on the pinky. So it really is repetitive. Since it's four note phrases, it's always down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up as you move across the strings. Uh, so let me play those first four phrases. Let me do it one more time a little bit slower. And then as you work this with time, you get a little faster, uh, and as long as you're playing it accurate, that's just going to get faster as you go. Now right now what I want to do is I want to take the sequential five and I want to run it all the way from the low E string to the high E string, and then we're going to slide up a half step and bring it back down. Uh, and then you'll kind of see why this is a good exercise. Uh, it actually takes quite a long time to move up the neck just because of the volume of notes that you're playing. Uh, there's just so many of them uh, because of the repetition. So let's just take it from the beginning and we'll run it all the way up and all the way back down. So let me repeat that last phrase, and I'll show you how to keep moving this up the neck. So one of the things you probably saw is pretty crucial is keeping your alternate picking uh, in line the whole way. So pinky and middle finger in this exercise are always upstrokes. So you got to go. That note is an upstroke, 
so that you can do a downstroke when you start the next series when you're going to move up from low E to high E. So uh, that's sequential fives. And uh, again, I think you'll find that really, really helpful. Just take it slow, keep it accurate. Now we're going to take that same exercise, the sequential fives, and we're going to apply one of the techniques at the very, very beginning, which was staccato. And uh, an exercise like this really lends itself well to a staccato style picking, and it'll help you develop this. Now, one of the things, I don't know if you noticed this, if you played with that after I played the example, but when you try to do the palm muting while you're picking, uh, it feels different. So it's not it's not like the same thing. You have to learn to control the pressure of your palm resting on the strings and picking at the same time to get that effect. So applying that to an exercise will just help you better develop that as you go. So we're going to take that very same exercise. But this time we're going to play those notes in a really staccato and muted fashion. And then as you get all the way up to the top, you're going to keep the uh, same thing as you go down. And um, I'm going to take the, uh, the top bit of that phrase, and then I'm going to walk it down and uh, just make sure that we've got that descending line just the same. So as we get up close to the top, You notice I'm on an upstroke on my pinky there, like, like I talked about. And then you're going to do a slide up downstroke. And then you're just going to walk it back down. So one, two, three, four, five. And then go to the next note down. And so on and so forth. But doing that nice staccato feel. And it's really uh, as much an exercise about learning the relationship between your pick and your palm for muting as it is coordinating your left hand. So a really powerful exercise to develop those two techniques. So uh, this is what it sounds like up to speed. The next warm-up exercise I'm going to show you uh, is actually one of my favorites because it's really simple, but the sky's the limit in terms of what you can do with it. So there's tons of options. And uh, this is where legato stuff is going to come into play as well. Now this just involves three notes per string. Um, and you can do as many or as few strings as you want. Well, I guess you can only go up to six, but uh, depending on what kind of guitar you have, maybe seven for some of you. But uh, you can do three notes per string, and I'm just going to work with it in uh, two string groups at the moment. So uh, we're going to take a major third interval, so two whole steps. So then we're going to do the same pattern on the G string. So I'm on the 5th fret on the D string with my index finger, and then I'm going the middle next on the 7th fret, and the pinky on the ninth fret. Again, alternate picking on this one, and then we'll do legato next. So... Just repeat that pattern, okay? I'm going to show you a few variations um, also. So this is one of the pattern versions. And the cool thing is you'll find out how these will play into the next section, which is learning all of the scale positions and, uh, and how these relate to each other and why they'll be so effective as an exercise. So that's one of them. Okay, then the uh, second one is going to be doing a minor third interval, but with a whole step in the beginning. So and then the half step second. So there's a minor third. Same thing on the G. And that fingering can look like this as well. Whatever's more comfortable. I tend to do this. All right. Then we're also going to do this pattern, which is... Which again is a minor third interval. But the half step is in the beginning, and the whole step's next. So just a reverse order from the other one. So just to recap so far, we've got major third interval, 
minor third interval, whole step first, and then minor third interval, half step first. All right, now I'm going to give you a couple of more. You could just work with those if you want, but uh, you'll be facing these when we start learning all of those scale patterns. Um, so we're going to do, we're going to take that one we were just on, minor third with a half step first, and we're just going to combine those two minor third positions. So, so one of them will have the half step first, and the next one will have the whole step first. And the next one I'm going to show you, we're going to go back to the major third. Then we're going to do the minor third above that. We're going to move up a half step. And do the minor third with the half step first. So you can kind of combine all of these. And you can keep adding your own variations if you want to. So the... Like I said, it's kind of the sky's the limit. So let me show you how you can work these in with alternate picking and uh, use these as a cool exercise. You can also take the same staccato approach that we covered earlier for this same exercise. Okay, now for those of you who are saying, come on Lincoln, really give me something challenging, uh, I'm going to show you one more exercise that I call the finger twister. And uh, this is something I'm still kind of getting down myself, so maybe we can work on it over time and get faster at it together. Um, I bet there's a bunch of you who will probably be able to play this faster than I can. So basically this exercise uh, is just another pattern exercise. Um, and it's uh, based around that first exercise that we covered with the uh, kind of the chromatic idea, at least per string, not true chromatic, but per string. So uh, this shape, again, and uh, but here's the pattern. You're going to go uh, third fret, index finger, low E string, and then you're going to do a whole step instead of doing a half step like last time with your ring finger, and that's going to be an upstroke. So then you're going to do a downstroke on the middle finger and drop down a half step and then an upstroke with the pinky so these are going to kind of skip each other so and then you're going to drop down with your ring finger so down up down up down ring finger on the fifth fret low e string right there and then this is where it gets kind of tricky you're actually going to jump up to the A string here, so, but you're on an upstroke. Last time we were on a downstroke there. So it's upstroke, index finger, third fret, A string, and then a downstroke, pinky finger, on the sixth fret, low E string. So, and then an upstroke on the fourth fret, A string, and you're gonna drop down. So these are just kind of moving up a whole step, down a half step, move up a whole step, down a half step, and you're gonna do that all the way up. So let me take this slow, but I'll kind of play a few of the strings in order, just like this. You can keep that going all the way up. And then when we come back down, we're going to do it in reverse order. So let me take it from here. That's going to be an upstroke. And you're going to drop down uh, a whole step, at, rather. Let me 
me cover that uh, descending line now. So um, once we hit that, it's be middle finger, fifth fret on the high E string there. And your ring finger, go up a half step. So you're going to go just the reverse order, down a whole step, up a half step. So let's take it from that seventh fret first on the pinky. The only trick to this exercise is, as I'm saying, down a whole step, up a half step, they're not always true whole steps um, as you're uh, doing descending and ascending both. So because of the way the strings are laid out, but I wanted to keep the pattern all in that same group of frets. So basically, that's kind of how that pattern works. And you can just go from the bottom all the way up and then from the top all the way back down. So let me take it and I'm going to go uh, one revolution. So from low E to high E, up a half step there and then all the way back down. If you'll notice that last note that I hit is an upstroke, so you're set to do a downstroke and uh, move up and do it over again with a uh, with another set. So you go. Well, there you have it. That's the finger twister, and good luck. As I mentioned earlier, we're going to cover scales and modes on this volume, and uh, I'm really excited about this piece because it's going to help you so much in really putting the neck together all the way up. And I remember first starting to play lead guitar, and I always wondered how guys could play leads just fluidly through the whole neck of the guitar without it didn't even look like they were thinking about it. And uh, over the years, I've kind of been able uh, to, to learn that and develop it, so I'm excited to share it with you. And one of the ways to do that is to understand scale patterns. And I want to make something real clear as we go into modes. I'm not a theory buff at all, so I know a little bit of theory, and what I do know I'm going to share with you. But I want to encourage those of you who feel overwhelmed by learning theory that you don't have to know it to be able to play it. So you can play some crazy stuff on the guitar and not have a clue what you did, and it still sounds the same. And that's kind of how I end up working myself. And so I'm going to teach you what I know and the bits and pieces that have really helped me put the neck together. But uh, I just want to state again, different people have different approaches to this. I don't tend to approach music from a theory angle. It's all about how it sounds. So to me, if it sounds good, it is good. So let's start this section with the names of each of the scale patterns. And uh, as we go through these again, I'm going to show you how they relate to the, using modes because typically I'll be in major or minor. That's Well, every song is actually in major or minor. Uh, the modes will vary uh, kind of the, the tonal structure of what those songs sound like. So these are the scale names in order. Ionian, Dorian, Phrygian, Lydian, Mixolydian, Aeolian, and Locrian. So each one of those scale names has a specific pattern that I'm going to show you. And again, you'll be able to link these scales together and go all the way up the neck and all the way back down. So let's take the first step here and we're going to learn the first scale position. And remember, there's seven of these, just like there's seven notes in the scale. And it'll bring us all the way back up to uh, eight or one. So that's going to be the octave. And so this scale is a major scale and it's got the name of it's called Ionian and uh, th these are all Greek names they came from years ago and I won't cover the history on that but uh, very simple scale goes like this <laughs> Now, all the scale patterns that I'm going to show you today are three notes per string. And as we covered alternate picking in volume one, 
I find that that's real important in syncing up your left hand and your right hand and keeping that clean. And so we're going to use that same technique here. Uh, down, up, down, up, down, up. So down, up, down, up, down, up. And we're going to take that scale and move it all the way up to the high E string and all the way back down. So uh, let's take the first note there. We'll just walk through it slowly, one note at a time, and uh, we'll cover this whole scale. So down stroke on the low E string, third fret, which is G. And we're going to be in the key of G major uh, for the purposes of showing you these patterns. So index finger on the G note on the low E string, which is the third fret. That'll be a down stroke. Then your middle finger on the fifth fret low E string, that's going to be an upstroke. Then I like to use my pinky finger for the third note. Some people like to use their ring finger. You do whatever's comfortable for you. My hands are my, my uh, little small for, the, for using my ring finger, so I gotta go with what I got, right? So there's the third note, which is gonna be a down stroke on the seventh fret low E string. Then an up stroke, on the index finger, third fret, A string. Down stroke, middle finger, on the 5th fret A string, and then again use the pinky finger on the 7th fret A string, which is going to be the 6. So let me walk up that far, and I want to show you something you'll find about these, is that's a, a major 3rd interval we're looking at, so which is 2 whole tones. Minor 3rd is going to be which is a whole tone and a half tone there. So. Same pattern, two times on an Ionian scale. Then the next note is gonna be the seven, major seven, uh, and that is an F sharp note, and it's on the D string on the fourth fret. And then there's the one again. That's that octave thing. We're gonna keep that walking up all the way to the top, so. Continuing on from there, we're going to use the pinky finger on the D string 7th fret. And these are just repeating notes up an octave at this point. On the G string 4th fret index finger. 5th fret middle finger. 7th fret on your pinky finger. 5th fret index finger on the B string. 7th fret, ring finger on the B string. Pinky finger on the 8th fret, B string. And then you'll notice, I don't know if you noticed this, but as we went through uh, D string and G string, same two patterns. And we're going to do that on the B and the E string. All right, so there's three notes per string on that pattern. Let me show you how it goes all the way up and all the way back down. That's the Ionian scale. The second scale pattern that we're going to cover is Dorian. And Dorian actually has a minor third in the beginning, uh, but we're going to still stay in the key of G. So if you look at these intervals, G being G A B, Dorian is going to start on the A note. So it's A Dorian, all right? So uh, down stroke. Uh, we're just going to keep alternate picking. I'm going to assume you know this from now on, so you can kind of figure that out. It should be down, up, down, up, down, up, and just alternate string to string. So uh, index finger, low E string on the fifth fret. That's the A note. Ring finger on the seventh fret, low E string. And your pinky finger. There's that minor third interval. Then index finger, 5th fret, A string. Middle finger, 7th fret, A string. Pinky finger, 9th fret, A string. Index finger on the D string, 5th fret. Middle finger, D string, 7th fret. And there's that 1 again. If you're looking at playing an A Dorian. So the 1 is actually right there, but it's for all intents and purposes. Uh, it's right there for the Dory mode, so. So let me take it carrying on from there. Pinky finger, ninth fret, D string. 
And one of the things I want to encourage you to do as you cover these scales is really look at the patterns. And at least this is how I look at it. And so, and this really helps me uh, to really break these down and make them make sense. So I, I kind of use memory to go, you know, what's the interval? Is it, or is it, and what order do those patterns come in? And you'll see one of three variations in each of these scales. It's either going to be a major third interval or a minor third interval. And sometimes the half step comes first. But those are the only three uh, patterns that you're going to see. They just come in different orders. So uh, walking the rest of the way up on the Dorian scale, index finger, G string, fifth fret, middle finger, G string, seventh fret, pinky finger, ninth fret, G string, index finger, on the seventh fret, B string, middle finger, eighth fret, B string, and this is one where the half step comes first in the pattern, and then pinky finger on the tenth fret, B string, index finger, seventh fret, high E string, and again, Half step comes first on this pattern. It's the middle finger on the uh, eighth fret, high E string, and then pinky finger on the tenth fret, high E string. So I know about this Dorian scale. I remembered this. It minor third interval comes first, and then there's three major third intervals on the next three strings, and then the high B and or the B and the high E strings have that uh, minor third interval with the half step first. And that's kind of how it helps me remember it. Now this might seem a little bit overwhelming right now, but like with anything, if you just take some time with it, take it slow, uh, you'll be able to commit these to memory with some time. The third scale name is Phrygian, and so here's the pattern on that one. You're going to start on your index finger, low E string. Remember, we're still in the key of G, so if you were looking at what Phrygian we're talking about, this would be B Phrygian. So uh, downstroke on uh, the seventh fret, low E string, index finger, then middle finger on the eighth fret. So this is one of those minor third intervals with the half step first. Pinky finger, tenth fret, low E string. Index finger on the seventh fret, A string. And your ring finger on the, uh, what is that? Ninth fret, A string. Pinky finger on the tenth fret, A string. So that's a minor third interval where the whole step comes first. So that's something I always remember about the Phrygian scale is. And you're gonna do uh, the D string index finger on the uh, seventh fret. Ring finger on the 9th fret D string. Pinky finger on the 10th fret D string. And you'll probably start noticing, it just sounds like a major scale, you're really just starting from a different note, and that's where the patterns come into play. So it's a three minor third uh, intervals on the first three strings, just the first one starts with the half step. And then you have an uh, index finger on the seventh fret G string, middle finger on the ninth fret G string, and your pinky finger on the eleventh fret G string, and then your index finger on the eighth fret on the B string, middle finger on the tenth fret, pinky finger on the twelfth fret B string, index finger. 8th fret, middle finger, 10th fret, high E string, and your pinky finger on the 12th fret, high E string. Do you notice that there's a, a repeat pattern on the B and the E string? So as that whole scale uh, works, it's like this. So the last three strings actually have major third interval patterns, but one, they have to shift up because of that lovely B string, the way that the guitar is tuned. So. So that's the Phrygian scale pattern in the key of G. The 
The fourth scale pattern is called Lydian, and uh, I'm just going to walk up from G on the low E string so you can make sure that you're keeping the context of this. So it'd be G, A, B, C, and that's where we're going to start the Lydian pattern. So in the key of G, it would be C Lydian on the eighth fret and middle finger on the tenth fret low E string. And then again, you can use your ring finger or your pinky to go up to the twelfth fret. So there's a major third interval. Then the ninth fret on the A string. In the middle finger, you're going to go 10th fret, uh, pinky finger, 12th fret, A string. Index finger, 9th fret, D string. Middle finger, 10th fret, D string. And your pinky finger on the 12th fret, D string. And so we've got two minor third intervals there that have the half step that comes first. So. Then we're going to do another minor third interval, but this one's going to have the whole step first. So index finger on the 9th fret, G string. Ring finger on the 11th fret. And pinky finger on the 12th fret, G string. So. Then we're going to do a little shift up, and this can be a little bit difficult depending on how you finger this, so again, just kind of work with it and see what works for you. I tend to like to use the pinky a lot, as I said before, uh, so I just go ahead and make this jump. So we'll go index finger on the B string, 10th fret, and then this pattern you can really do a couple of different ways. You can use your uh, ring finger on the 12th fret. And then your pinky finger on the 13th fret. Or you can do it with your middle finger and your ring finger, uh, uh, respectively. So, or either way really works fine. Uh, then the high E string is going to be a major third interval. Index finger on the 10th fret. 12th fret, middle finger. Then you do your pinky finger on the 14th fret on the high E string. So that pattern in order goes. So some people find it easier to use index, middle, ring. And then you can kind of see my index finger, my middle finger, and my ring finger, they're already positioned. So it makes that a little bit easier to play for some people. Um, I find myself actually use both, just depending, so. Or depending on what I'm doing with that particular scale shape on those uh, top strings. So let me just run that whole scale from top to bottom. And one more time with the alternate fingering on the B string. And that's the Lydian scale pattern. The fifth scale pattern is called Mixolydian. Uh, this one starts in the key of G on the 10th fret low E string, which is a D. So if you're playing in the key of G, it would be D Mixolydian. So let's walk this scale up. And uh, I can kind of give you some hints now that you're getting a little more familiarized with actual patterns and intervals. This is three major third intervals back to back on the E string, A string, and D string. And they're all in the same frets. So. Those are the first three patterns of this scale, which make this one actually a little bit easier to remember for me. So let me take that one more time, a little slower. We're going to jump to the G string and you're going to move up a half step and we're going to do a minor third interval with the half step first. So, and that one's kind of a standalone in this scale a little bit because then we're going to move up another half step to the 12th fret. We're going to put our index finger on the 12th fret B string and do another minor third interval, the half step first. So, so on the B string, it's going to be index finger on the 12th fret, then middle finger, 13th fret, pinky finger on the 15th fret. 
And then on the high E string, you're gonna go index finger, 12th fret, ring finger on the 14th fret, and pinky finger on the 15th fret. Of all the scale patterns, this is the one that I tend to use the most. I just tend to be drawn towards this, and I'll show you why in a little bit. Uh, so I'm gonna take this scale and run it from the low E string all the way up to the high E string and back down. It goes like this. Let me do it one more time, a little bit slower. And one thing you'll find as you practice that, and you'll notice I'm using alternate picking again, uh, just doing that slowly, accurately, uh, not changing tempo will really help build your speed and uh, you can kind of work up to uh, something like this. The sixth scale pattern is called Aeolian, and Aeolian is actually minor. So Ionian is major, Aeolian is minor. And uh, if you look at in your in the key of G, and this is something I'll talk about in the next section, is relative majors and minors. So again, staying in the key of G, if I just walk down, I'm going to end up on E, and you can probably kind of feel this, but. That's E minor, so. So that's E minor, or E aeolian, and that's where we're gonna play that scale. So uh, if you move up to the 12th fret with your index finger, that's E, that's the uh, octave E. We're gonna start this scale here. So again, I'm gonna give you another hint on the first two strings of this scale, just to help move it along a little quicker. These are two minor third intervals, as you might have guessed, since this is the, uh, a minor scale. Uh, the whole step comes first. So it's gonna be E, F sharp, G. One, two, three. And then you're gonna repeat that on the A string. And again, you can do these with your middle finger, ring finger combo, or you can do them with the uh, ring finger, pinky combo. Or whatever feels more comfortable for you. That's the, the real key with playing these things. Is... Then the next two strings are gonna be major third intervals and all the roots stay there on the, on the 12th fret. So index finger, D string, 12th fret. And your middle finger is gonna go 14th fret, pinky finger on the 16th fret. Then we're gonna repeat that pattern on the G string. So as you'll notice, we kind of have two pairs of patterns. A pair of minor thirds, whole step first, and then a pair of major thirds. Then we're gonna do another major third interval, but we're gonna move up a half step on the B string. It's gonna start on the 13th fret index finger, and then to the 15th fret with the middle finger, and then you can go the 17th fret with either the ring finger or the pinky. Now I've mentioned that a few times with changing your fingerings and one thing I wanna encourage you with is try to pick one that you stick with. That way your hand doesn't get confused when you, know, you don't have to actually make that decision while you're trying to play a lick. So you can just kinda of commit to one of those. And if there's instances where you're gonna rehearse it ahead of time and kinda of make that change, I think that works, uh, that tends to work better for me than trying to do it on the fly. If I try to do it on the fly, I typically mess it up, so. So moving on to the high E string, this is gonna be a minor third interval. We're gonna move uh, the index finger up another half step on the high E string, so 14th fret, then your uh, middle finger, and there's the one, that's G, that's the key we're in, and then high E string, pinky finger on the 17th fret. And that ends uh, the Aeolian pattern. So again, if it's G Ionian, you're in the key of G major, then it's E minor or E Aeolian. So uh, let me take that scale from top to bottom.
And then let me do it again with the alternate fingering. And that's E Aeolian. We're in the key of G. The seventh and last scale pattern that I'm going to show you is called Locrian, and it roots on the 14th fret low E string if we're in the key of G, and that's F sharp. So if you're in the key of G, it's F sharp Locrian. So let's take our index finger, start on the low E there, 14th fret, then our middle finger on the 15th fret, pinky finger on the 17th fret. So, and the neat thing about the Locrian scale pattern is it's actually three pairs, kind of like Ionian is, where it's, and then. Locrian's similar, just different intervals. So you can do, uh, do two minor third intervals on the low E and A strings with the half step first. And then the D and G strings are going to be minor third intervals, starting on the same fret, which is 14, but you're going to use the whole step first. And on those, again, you can use the alternate fingering if you like. Or. And then on the B and high E string, it's two major third intervals starting on the 15th fret. So I tend to like the scale a lot just because it's got those repeating patterns. They're a little bit easier. You don't have to change positions to, uh, to do those repeat patterns very much on this scale. So uh, let me take this one from the low E up to the high E. And uh, we'll just run it over one more time here. And one more time with those alternate fingerings. And here's the Locrian scale pattern played a little bit faster. Now that we've covered all seven scale patterns, I'm going to show you some examples of how to actually turn this into music. I know for me when I was learning these, I kind of got all the positions down, and that was my first question. Okay, now that I have all this knowledge, how do I actually make some music out of it? And so I'm going to give you a couple of scenarios of how I apply these in my personal playing. And, um, and so the first example is going to be kind of a funk groove. And uh, just to be honest with you, I, I rarely venture, you know, way out into, like, I've, I've heard people talking about playing in Locrian mode and playing in Phrygian. And I'll show you kind of how I view that through my lens. But again, I'm not a theory buff. I just take uh, the bits of it that work for me and that help me accomplish what I'm trying to say and to be able to play from my heart. So I look at this as a tool. Uh, so again, encouragement to you, try not to be overwhelmed when you're learning music theory. This is uh, knowledge of theory is just one of the tools that you get to help you make great music. And uh, so again, don't be overwhelmed. Um, this is this funk groove. Uh, we're going to play in the key of B minor. Now sometimes with funk grooves, and the reason I'm, I'm choosing a funk groove is because a lot of times these grooves are a little nebulous actually, whether they're in a major key or a minor key, depending on how you approach them. So you can play um, this type of groove, and this is actually the groove um, from a song off the Today is the Day project that I'll cover a little later in this volume called Give and Praise, but it goes... Now I can play this one lick in here that goes... 
and I'm actually lifting that up to a major third. So it's kind of going back and forth a little bit between major and minor, but you just, if you start playing major over that, it's going to sound a little bit weird if you do it too much. So it's just little bits and pieces. Now I've heard that some jazz guys use the modes to just do some passing tones to create some tension and then you resolve it with notes that are actually in the key of the song. So let's take this B minor um, and I'll show you how it can vary from that a little bit. But uh, from uh, the last uh, bit we, we learned that Aeolian is minor. So if you look at this pattern that's the Aeolian pattern rooting from the B note and this is how these mode patterns work. Uh, whatever key you're in, if it's a B minor and you want to play a certain pattern, uh, you can play the Dorian pattern rooting on B, then you're kind of playing B Dorian if that makes sense. So, And one interesting thing about B Dorian or about Dorian is there's only one interval difference between Dorian and minor. So. Dorian has a, ma a minor third, but it has a major six in it, and that major six has a real cool feel uh, to doing riffs like. So, giving praise has a bit of Dorian going on in it when I'm playing uh, my solo. So. That's an example of how to apply a mode to your playing and what you know the, the cool thing is you don't have to know that to play that um, and typically I'll play stuff and then other people will tell me actually what it is but I just went for feel so I'll combine my approach with blues with twos and then adding a six to it so uh, you got a blues scale which again fits into the framework of minor covered blues and pentatonic on volume one in depth uh, and then you can add that two and the six which gives it a little flavor of Dorian so that's one example of uh, how you can apply a mode to your solo playing one other thing I want to say on that note is uh, Dorian tends to work better on those funk grooves and uh, throwing that major six in there you gotta make sure that you do it where it feels right um, I'm going to use an example now, uh, which is typically where I end up. That's either in straight major or minor. Uh, so if I'm playing in minor, that's again Aeolian. And uh, if it's something that has a, a, a more conventional minor feel to it, um, then you kind of want to stick around those notes. At least I think they work a little bit better. Uh, and again, make sure you go with your heart and what feels right to you. There are no wrong notes. Uh, there are no rules, that's what's lovely about music, is you can kind of do whatever you want to do. There are things that, you know, can sound offensive to the masses, I guess I would say. So I would try to stay away from stuff like that. And uh, especially playing in a worship environment most of the time, like I do, uh, I want to make sure it's music that moves people and uh, that's not self-indulgent. So um, I'm going to give you an example of just playing uh, in a pretty straight up, minor key. Uh, we'll keep in the same key in B. That's B natural minor. And again, minor is Aeolian. So if we're in B minor. We're going to play the Aeolian scale pattern, rooting from B. So there's Aeolian. And uh, one of the real important factors about knowing these scale patterns in order is this is what starts to allow you to play across the neck. Um, and we'll cover that uh, in, in, in kind of a basic form, a kind of a skeleton form, and you can plug these into it uh, right after this. But uh, if you move down a whole step, the fifth position scale is Mixolydian. So if we're in B minor or Aeolian, we would be in A Mixolydian. And then what I'll do is I'll take pieces of these scale patterns. So I know that the top two strings, the high B or the B and high E, uh, those scale patterns are uh, like this. Two minor third intervals, one with the half step first, one with the, and then the next one with the whole step. 
Then the top of the Aeolian scale pattern is. And then the Locrian scale pattern on the top is. So I don't know if that's starting to make sense, but you can. You can put together a little run out of that if you wanted to by knowing those scale patterns. So if you're playing in a minor key, you can stay within the minor scale. Um, I still like using those twos a lot. That type of feel. Now what you'll notice is I'm using the Aeolian scale pattern here, but then when I drop down, that's stepping into the Mixolydian pattern. And these all just start to link together. So the B string and E string there are actually the high pattern from the Mixolydian scale. Then I'll go to Aeolian, the Locrian pattern. And when you, when you learn those all up and down the neck, you can kind of link them together. Um, and I'll show you again in the next section just a simple way to look at it in terms of three zones that at least helps me break it down a little bit. But playing those melodic notes uh, in a minor key uh, and knowing these scales, you can kind of jump around a bit. kind of jump around just by using those scale patterns and linking them together like a chain. So that's an example of using Aeolian. All right, so we've covered a lot of information up to this point, and uh, this is the part I've been really excited about, to talk about how to know the neck and really solo fluidly all the way across the fretboard without having to think about it too much. So we can take a lot of the stuff that we've already covered with the exercises, legato, staccato, and all those scales and modes, and plug those in to this, and uh, this is where it really gets cool. And then after this, I'll give you a few riffs that you can go ahead and plug in uh, to this whole technique as well, and you'll be off to the races. I think you'll have a lot of fun with it. So when I'm playing in the key of A minor, I'm gonna stick around in this, what I call a box, and it's basically where that Aeolian scale falls down here by the fifth fret. <laughs> So it's basically that, that minor third interval. And uh, one of the things there is you can play a pentatonic scale or a blues scale, and those are basically like skeletal versions of Aeolian. So they have the one, the minor three, so they leave out the two, the four, the five, they leave out the six, and then the blues scale adds a flat five. So then the uh, minor seven, and then back to the one, so. Now, so I can kind of actually combine all three of these. So I can just use a standard pentatonic, I can use blues, and I can use minor all at the same time, depending on what I'm going for. And the great thing about um, the way this works is you've automatically got another position you can solo in, which is one octave above this. So if you're playing here, you can go up 12 frets and do it up here, up at the 17th fret. So you've got an A position here and an A position here. So there's two of the three primary ones that I use. And then the third one, uh, and now you really see how knowing these scale patterns is going to come into play, actually falls right up here by the 12th fret. And typically I'll start it up on the B or high E strings. It's just the way that my, uh, my eyes look at it. But it's this pattern here. And this is actually the Dorian scale. Uh, so. So you can hop right up there and have that position. So you got one here, one here, which is the Dorian position, and then you've got it up here again. Now you're not in Dorian mode, you're just playing that scale pattern in the key of A minor or A Aeolian. So uh, one thing that's kind of cool to do is take the top pieces of those scales that I showed you and actually link them together. So uh, I told you sometimes I'm uh, drawn towards Mixolydian. Let me show you why. Here's A Aeolian. Well, the 
scale down one step from that is Mixolydian. And now the top part of that scale has that pattern in Mixolydian. The top part of the Aeolian scale, the top part of the Locrian scale, Ionian, and then Dorian. So you can jump right up there, and that's kind of a position I like. And uh, let me show you why I like each of these positions specifically. If I'm doing kind of a blues style riff, it just works well in that pentatonic or blues box. Now knowing these intervals down here, that's down by that Mixolydian pattern. So. And then I like this Dorian position because you can do stuff like this. So kind of knowing some of those key riffs that you can do. Bending those two strings together. It's kind of a nice sound. You can do some bending in here. And uh, part of soloing is knowing where to end, kind of an ending note that, that fits with the key that you're in. And so if you're in A minor, something like that, you might play. Just kind of knowing to end on those notes. And uh, it really works well, the Dorian uh, scale pattern works well for pulling off riffs. So uh, and then you can, of course, move up here to the octave. Which is the same thing as here. And you can kind of really get a lot of mileage out of that. And uh, so it's very, very cool being able to take those scale patterns, link the neck together like a chain, but really maybe look at it in those three zones. So it's uh, the standard Aeolian here or pentatonic. You got that up here an octave. And then you can jump on that Dorian pattern right down here around the 12th fret. And uh, this applies to all the different keys. You can just move that around the neck and have a great time. I'm gonna give you another example of linking the neck together and using these scale patterns, again, just like a chain, uh, and, and using those pattern pieces to get from one side to the other if you uh, choose to do so. Uh, but uh, and then I'll give a couple of just brief playing examples. But then when I teach you the solos from the songs off Today is the Day, I'll show you in depth uh, exactly how I did that in those songs and give you some actual playing examples. And then I'll play along with those tracks and also give you some different versions that I might have done. Uh, you know, because as I'm writing a solo, I'll do a lot of trial and error and try things. So I'll give you more in-depth playing examples in the actual song section, which is coming up later in this volume. So now we're going to talk about playing in, in a major key and how I approach that, just positionally. How do I know where to go? Um, now, one of those basic things is, if I'm in the key of D, you can go to the low E string and play the Ionian scale. And that certainly works. But as I mentioned earlier, there's not a lot of good spots in that particular scale shape for me to play riffs. That's just, you know, for me personally. So I got to thinking one day, well, if I play riffs in the pentatonic or blues or Aeolian kind of box, what if I did that, but I was playing in a major key? So that led me to another thing, and I did some studying on this and found out some neat stuff, that there's actually a thing called a relative minor and a relative major. So for every major or minor, there is a relative of it that is the opposite. So uh, let's say we're playing in D major. The relative minor of D major is basically a minor third below that, which would be B minor. So B minor, D major, same key. They just have a different feel to them. And uh, if you look at that in terms of the scale, minor or Aeolian is the sixth position scale. Well, it's also the sixth note of the scale. So if we go to uh, D major, one, two, three, four, five, six, look at that, that's B. That's the minor, that's the relative minor of D. So when you're playing in D major, you can play a B minor, uh, pentatonic or Aeolian, 
or blues and still get those same riff shapes that you had when you were playing in a minor key, you might just choose to end on a different note. So here we're in D major. That's that B minor box up there. But I might end on D instead. But if I'm in B minor, end there instead. So you can use the same technique. Then when we apply this to linking the neck together, we've got B here. You can go up the octave. And then you've got that in-between position, which here in the key of B is that Dorian shape, but it shows up here, so. might just end it a little different. Then like I showed you before, that's the Aeolian kind of range right there. You can go down to Mixolydian and play its top couple of notes. You can play the Aeolian shape. Locrian. and you're back up to Dorian. So if you actually wanted to run those up the neck while you were playing in a key like that, you certainly can do that. So you can take those and literally just play all over the neck just by joining those pieces together. All right, now for kind of the extra little spice on uh, that previous section. Um, I'm gonna now show you some specific riffs and patterns that you can add to everything that we've covered so far that I think you're gonna really enjoy. Uh, these things help me a lot in terms of uh, coming up with a little more variety and variation. So um, here's a neat thing too. All of the scales that we covered, you know, there was a section on warm-ups and exercises. The neat thing is everything we've covered so far you can use as a warm-up or an exercise very, very easily. Uh, in fact, running those scales, those mode scales, from top to bottom, uh, maybe starting in G major like we covered, uh, then do it in a different key, do it in A major, and learn those all over the neck. But as you're learning those scale patterns and how they relate to each other, you can also be doing great exercise with alternate picking. You can throw some legato in there and get creative and do those things that you find are working well for you. All right, now for the riffs. Uh, the first riff that I'm gonna show you is uh, one that's up on the high strings and it's kind of a, a repeating pattern and it has some alternate picking and it has some uh, legato, hammer-ons and pull-offs in it as well. And uh, so I'll start, this one's gonna be in uh, A minor or C major, which would be the relative major. And I wanna encourage you to do something Go through and just pick keys randomly and then find the relative minor or relative major so you'll get familiar with those. And knowing, hey, if I'm in A minor, I can just play in C, or if, certainly if I'm in C, I can play in A, Aeolian, and kind of have my bag of tricks that I like to use. All right, so here we go. We're in A minor. Now if I walk those uh, top uh, patterns together again, top part of the Mixolydian scale. There's Aeolian, Locrian. Now, I like this one because it's the same pattern twice in a row. And remember the exercise that we did? Well, here's where it comes into play. So, uh, you can do some variations with that. So maybe you wanna take that exercise that we did and throw just a little sliver of it in for a little flavor. Um, now you can also do some other variations and this is one of my favorites is starting here and then we're going to use hammer-ons and pull-offs to do this thing. Now 
Now I'm going to take that same riff and slow it way down so you can see exactly what I'm doing. And uh, you'll, you'll notice that I'm using that alternate picking to kind of keep the riff bouncing along. And I mentioned earlier that you can use picking with legato style to uh, kind of like you're skipping a rock just to keep it bouncing along the surface. And that's what this picking is going to do for this. So uh, check out how I'm doing this. Starting with my picking hand, I'm actually doing this on an upstroke. So it goes up, down, up with your middle finger on the 10th fret high E string. And then you're going to do what I call a trill. Um, and it goes like this. All right, so that's, so starting from the beginning, up, down, up. So just a, three notes on that uh, middle finger, 10th fret high E string. And then you're going to do a hammer on up to the 12th fret high E string with your pinky, or you can use your ring finger. I'm going to choose to use my pinky. And then the trill is going to go. Upstroke. So. And then you'll notice I'm doing a downstroke on my pinky when I go to the B string 12th fret. So the whole thing going up, down, up, then the trill, downstroke right there on the B. You kind of speed it up. Uh, as you practice it. So anyway, that's a real fun riff to do. Now here's a real cool thing about a riff like this. That is a pattern. Ba -da 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 -da. So it's just a, it's a picking pattern and a fingering pattern. But I, I realized early on that you don't have to keep things at the same intervals. You can move them around a little bit and play them in different positions. So as we apply that, to understanding uh, your mode shapes and knowing where those go, you could do that in a different position. So that one there would be if I was playing in A minor or C major. So. Now those are the top notes, again, of the Locrian scale. Down to A minor, so. Now I might want to do that just down here on the top notes of the Mixolydian shape, still staying in the key of A minor. So it's that Mixolydian and on the top. Basically doing the same technique, you're just changing the intervals there. And you can move that all around the whole neck and uh, really come up with some neat um, uh, variations of that riff. All right, now staying in the key of A minor, uh, we're actually going to uh, cover another riff. And remember I told you you can play blues, pentatonic, or minor, and it's basically the same thing. Blues and pentatonic are just a skeletal version of the A minor scale. So, uh, and then in the positions, we've got this position down here. Then we had that middle one that was based on the Dorian shape scale. And how I know the Dorian scale is, again, those minor third intervals on the B and E string with the half step coming first and the uh, and in that particular scale they're repeat pattern so and then you got the higher octave okay so we're going to work in that middle position uh, where I'm doing the Dorian uh, shape scale and here's what's cool is if you spend a little time figuring out what's around those notes, you can actually incorporate some blues into it. And so um, this is a, the exact same picking pattern, same, uh, same deal as this lick. But we're just going to change the interval and turn it into a completely different riff. And uh, this concept, I, I like to look at it this way. We're going to make about a 10% change to the riff itself but you're going to hear probably a 70 or 80% uh, change in the sound of the riff. And I love doing stuff like this because you're basically just taking an idea and a concept that you know and that you've practiced, uh, and then you're able to reapply it and, and effectively reinvent it. So check this one out. Now let me slow that one down and show you 
how we're doing exactly the same thing as we were in the other riff, same picking pattern, same fingering, we're just changing the intervals slightly. I'll take that a little bit slower and break it down one note at a time. So this is in A, in A minor, using the top notes of the Dorian shape scale. And there's the flat five, right there, just gonna go down a half step. So we're gonna start on uh, the high E, middle finger, 12th fret, and the upstroke, downstroke, upstroke, and then do that trill, which is gonna be your pinky, up to the 15th fret high E string. Then go back to the middle finger on the 12th fret E string. Then that flat five. Then you're gonna drop down to the pinky uh, on the B string, 15th fret, that's the downstroke, so. Now that particular riff can just get blazingly fast if you practice it. So you can be playing along in the B minor groove and uh, you know, in that blues feel. I'm gonna cover Give and Praise later, so the same kind of feel. Mm -hmm. Same technique, you can do it across a whole bunch of different shapes, uh, but use the same picking pattern uh, and same variations in fingering, just changing intervals, and you've got a whole plethora of licks that you can apply across this concept. The next riff that I want to show you, and this is more of a pattern than a riff, but this is something that's come in very useful for me when I'm playing, uh, when I want to play a fast kind of ascending or descending run to get me to another place where I can start playing melody again. So uh, I like to view solos sometimes that way where I'll play a melodic theme and then I'll have a fast run that kind of builds me up to another place. Um, I covered on volume one a song called Everlasting God where there was some melodic themes to it. Some octave stuff like that. And then I would, would do a, uh, more pattern-based uh, soloing kind of kind of stuff that was a little more picking, a little more pattern, hammer-ons, pull-offs, and uh, then I got back up to the melodic part at the end. So I'm going to show you this technique, and this is something that, uh, again, you can use as an exercise, uh, a warm-up, and it's a great thing to do for that. And this incorporates all of the seven scale positions that uh, we learned earlier. So you can take these in order, and uh, you'll be surprised, I think, if you take this slow in the beginning, uh, start it with alternate picking, leave out the uh, hammer-ons and pull-offs legato stuff for now until you feel more comfortable with it. But you can uh, do this very simple technique and get some surprising results. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start, and we're actually going to change keys just to get a little different familiarity. I'm going to do this in the key of, uh, let's say, B, uh, B major. We're going to start there. So 7th fret, low E string, with your index finger. And again, three notes per string. And what we're going to do is walk up the neck six notes. And all this technique requires is we're going to repeat the last three notes we played and then go up three more, staying in the scale. We try that one more time, real slow. And then as you might have guessed, we're going to repeat those three notes and go up three more. And then again. And then again. And then we can go back down the neck by hitting a downstroke and sliding up to the next scale position note, which in this case is gonna be Dorian. right back where we started. 
Now let me show you what that exercise sounds like a little more up to speed. And again, that's another exercise that you can do with the staccato technique where you're muting really firmly with your palm and mute that entire run like this. As well as playing that last riff uh, staccato, you can also do it legato. So you can just roll that whole thing. And typically uh, what I'll do is you roll that whole thing up the neck. I would just keep those, uh, you know, maybe do down strokes on each string or down up, down up each string alternating uh, to keep that going. So if you're doing, you do it like that. And that technique can also be applied all around the neck. So again, you'll probably see this as a consistent theme here. I like to take these patterns that all my fingers and my hands will get to know and just modify them a little bit and make them into something different. Uh, so you can make these little runs that go up if you're playing, uh, say, in A minor. And then there's that mixolydian shape right there. And say I want to go up to something up here. But I want to do a run that goes up there. I might only use a little bit of that last technique that I showed you. So it's... And just repeat the second set. Maybe I'll repeat those two. So in a solo setting... You can use that as a little flurry just to build the intensity and energy of the solo. And here's one more variation that you can do with that same technique. You'll notice I'm just going to change the pattern on the top strings just slightly. So that's another little pattern that you can do. Uh, I just did a slight variation on the bottom of that pattern. Just something a little bit different. So I did those repeating notes. to the last phrase if you want to get all the way up to the high E string from the low E string that's a cool run to use and kind of get up to that range so just another variation of that same technique this next riff is something that I actually came up with a long time ago, I think when I was about 18 years old. And uh, it's a very melodic and it's a descending run. Um, and it, uh, it sounds like this. Probably heard me play that in something before. Um, and so let me break that down for you. Uh, and again, as with all the riffs that we're playing, you can make these your own and, you know, vary them however you want to do that. So let me take that one note at a time and uh, I'll start on the high E string and show you how that riff goes. So we're going to start up here on the high E string with the ring finger. Just do a half step bend and come back down. And then pinky finger on the B string, 17th fret on a downstroke. So it's two downstrokes to start this riff. Then ring finger, 14th fret, G string, and that's an upstroke. Pull off, down to index finger on the G string, 12th fret. Then you're going to go down to the 11th fret on the G string. And you can pick that or you can slide it. I like to slide it usually. And you can pick that or you can slide it down. It's totally up to you. So you can do it like this. Or you can pick every note. or do the whole thing with a more legato feel. 
Now continuing on with that riff. So it's really repeating the beginning. Index finger, I'm gonna bend that up, do that same half step bend. Index finger, 12th fret, D string. Then your index finger is gonna do the rest here. Index finger on the 12th fret, A string. And then down to the 9th fret on the A string, which is the major third of the key we're playing that riff in, which is D. And again, that's a riff you can apply all around the neck in different keys. You can do it in minor if you want to do it in minor, and that works really well. So let's say we're in E minor. Check this out. Same exact riff. And what it is, is it's like putting a template around groups of notes. So we're working here, if we're in E minor, let's do the Mixolydian scale, which if we're in E minor, that would make it D Mixolydian. And if you'll notice an interesting thing about the Mixolydian scale versus the major scale, there's only one note difference, just like with Aeolian and Dorian. So if you're playing in D major, all the notes of that riff, they fit just fine. It kind of works around it. If you're playing in E minor or G major, all the notes of that riff still work in that as well. So that's D major, and then this is E minor playing in D mixolydian. Or E aeolian. So you can take that particular riff and move it around and use it in different contexts uh, to create a different mood. So uh, let me give you an example of playing that riff in A minor. You might be playing a slower song. That's just using a piece of that riff, but... And I might jump up and do it up the octave. So it can make a really pretty melodic statement. So now you can take that riff and play with it and find different ways to incorporate it into different contexts and keys and tempos. This riff is based on a pattern that I actually learned a long time ago. Uh, and again, like you've seen me do with a lot of my stuff, I'll take a pattern and then just make a variation. I think that that's a neat way to reinvent something. So this pattern is one you actually might already know. It simply goes like this. This is B minor. Very simple pattern. Let's take it up here to E minor. Now for those of you who don't know this, let me break that down a little bit slower. You can use your pinky if you want to. You can see that that's in that box, that minor box, that's E minor. There's pentatonic blues. All right. So we're taking four notes down, and then just going right back up. But we're doing it in, that one's in uh, a pentatonic interval. Now this one I thought, why not just move it up? So let me take it down here. It's a little bit more comfortable for me to play. Let's go back to B minor. Let's stay in that same key. But as you'll remember, this is Aeolian or Mixolydian uh, scale top here. There's Aeolian. And remember that one I like a lot, Locrian? It's got those major third intervals. And I thought, what if we took the same pattern and just did it there? See how different that sounds than this? 
So you could be in the key of B minor. And rather than, rather than doing, you could do. This gives a little bit different flavor to it. And then I also came up with another variation on this same riff, which was this. So I went, wow, you can change this a lot, and this probably works anywhere on the neck, like this. Now that right there is a pattern that we're going to see later in two of the songs that I'm going to teach you the solos on. And uh, this lick up to speed sounds like this. But again, it's using the exact same technique as this very simple riff. One of the first things I played at the beginning of this volume was a legato riff, and you're probably recognizing now that it was in A minor, but it was done in the Dorian scale shape, right up here around the 12th fret. Uh, let me play that riff for you one more time. So as you watch that, I'm sure you can identify that that's that Dorian scale shape. If I just went down one more string, it would be right there. So. So what I want to do is show you that pattern, and it's another one that you can use to play these fast runs, and you can do them with combinations of legato, you know, hammer runs and pull offs, and that alternate picking. So, and I think I played a different variation of that earlier doing that as well, and it went like this. So kind of similar to the prior riff, I'm doing those down up down, down up down, down up down on my picking hand to keep that kind of alive. Now, Listen, when I was coming up with this idea um, and just trying to, you know, do that combination of legato and a little bit, there was no, you know, specific strategy. I just went with what felt right. And I really want to encourage you as you play your solos, you know, you may not feel it the same way that I'm feeling it, but feel free to do your own thing. And uh, there's a story I remember about that. When I was playing with Steve Perry and I had to learn all of Neil Sean's guitar parts, well, as you know, Neil's an amazing guitar player. And I found that out uh, as I was trying to learn his parts. But one thing I noticed was Neil had a very specific way that he would play fast licks. And he would do them in a different shape. He would start them in a different place than I typically would have. So what I had to do on some of those was make up you know, my own version of the fast section of the song, just making sure that it started on the same notes and that it ended on the same notes. But but I didn't necessarily play the exact same pattern that he did, but I did what worked for me, and the main thing was I wanted to make sure and convey the same feel and message that he did, or at least get as close as I could. So with that in mind, let me show you the pattern of this run, and you can take this pattern and totally make it your own in terms of picking patterns, uh, hammer-ons, pull-offs, however you want to make it sound. So I'm going to pick each note as I show it to you. So we're going to start this riff on the index finger, 12th fret, B string. And uh, for the alternate picking version, which is what we're going to do now, we're going to start with a down stroke and then just alternate from there. And middle finger, 13th fret. Pinky finger, 15th fret. And then we're going to repeat that pattern. That's that Dorian scale. And then go back down. And then back up. Let me take that one more time, just a little bit faster. And now let me play this up to speed with alternate picking. Now let me play it one more time for you using a combination of 
hammer-ons and pull-offs for the legato sound and alternate picking as well. As you can see with that particular riff, there's a lot of variations you can do in terms of picking pattern. If you're going to do legato, staccato picking, whatever you want to do. Um, the way that I figured that out in terms of playing that fast was something that required trial and error on my part. And honestly, I don't know exactly what I'm doing. I just know that it feels right. And that makes it so that I can keep doing it over and over again. That's what I've trained my hands to do. So it doesn't seem as difficult now, but certainly when I started doing this pattern, it didn't start like that. So uh, stay encouraged, keep it slow and accurate, and speed's going to come in time. Well, I hope this section on riffs has been uh, helpful to you and helped you get an insight on how I approach the guitar neck and how I play my solos. And uh, as we move into the next section where I'm going to cover some of the songs from the Today is the Day project, I'm going to use these same techniques and I'll keep referencing back to them so that you can just get more and more familiar with how I approach these and how I use them in an actual musical context. So again, I hope these have been helpful to you and uh, man, I wish you the best of luck as you continue to practice these and incorporate them into your own playing.